Happy Friday, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the Jacob and Jacob podcast. You know me and you know the other Jacob, but today we're really lucky to be joined by ESPN senior MLB insider Jeff Passan. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on today. My pleasure, fellas. Glad to be here. So, Jeff, as an ESPN insider, you're breaking news left and right. What has been the strangest or weirdest place that you've had to break a story? Oh, my goodness. The strangest place I've broken a story. I'm trying to think. You know, like, it's on my couch most of the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you really have me, like, racking my brain here because uh, there have been, you know... I'll tell you a story. This was a long time ago. This was back when I was an intern uh, at the Newark Star Ledger in 2001. And so you guys literally were not born yet. Um, I, uh, I was in Syracuse, New York, and Will Allen, who was a cornerback and safety for the Giants, had been their first round pick that year. And Someone had come up to him at his apartment in Syracuse, squirted gasoline on him and threatened to throw like a match at him if he didn't give them the jewelry that uh, he was wearing. So I, I knew Will from college because I went to Syracuse too. And I went back and uh, I talked with him about it. And I wrote the story sitting in my car in the parking lot at Will Allen's house. And so, like, it, there are, you know, a, as a reporter, you have to understand uh, news does not ever sleep, and you are going to do things from some very, very weird places, and uh, I would say a parking lot in Syracuse, New York, is is a pretty odd one. Now, is that the biggest story you ever broken, the story about your friend? Oh, God, no, I mean... Back then, it was it was a good one. Here's it, you know what? Here's actually a better one. Uh, Mike Trout's original contract extension I broke from Sochi, Russia. <laughs> I was in I was in Sochi covering the Olympics and got a tip that Trout uh, was going to be signing for six years and around 150 million with the Angels. And so I was covering like snowboarding and other other winter sports and the fact that i uh got to do a baseball story from there was was pretty uh pretty rad i enjoyed that that's uh that's pretty awesome uh do you have a, a biggest story that you've ever broken or uh do you think uh there's some that are all uh pretty big i mean it depends you know it depends what you're constituting is breaking like in terms of contracts, I, you know, I broke both the Trout Steels, um, uh, got uh, Arenado's contract. I was there with Cole's contract. There were, you know, there have been other mega extensions that I've gotten in terms of trades. I got, uh, you know, the Lindor trade this year first. Um, to, to me, like the, uh, you wouldn't like consider this breaking news under the traditional way, but the, the story that I wrote on Drew Robinson, uh, which was an extraordinarily impactful story that nobody else had even known about, let alone reported. And, and that, to me, uh, like that's, it's not breaking news in the traditional sense, but when, when you have an exclusive story of that magnitude, uh, that to me beats any transactional news because that's the kind of thing where if, you know, if, if I have a contract or a trade, you know, Ken Rosenthal is going to have it 30 seconds later. Uh, if you have a story like that, that you've spent months on uh, and, and it just goes out there into the world, no other reporter can, can chase that. That's just a, Hey, the, the other person got the story and I didn't. So uh, moving on from the uh, talk about breaking news and stuff, uh, so this might come off as a bit of a funny question, but we hear you can do a pretty good Elmo impression. Is there any chance <laughs> we could uh, get you to do that for us? It depends. What do you want me to say? Maybe, uh, maybe give us your uh, MVP uh, picks for this season. Um, 
I need to I need to remember who my MVP pick was in the in the National League. I'm pretty sure I had Juan Soto. So and in the okay, here we go. Mike Trout is very clearly the best player in baseball, but Juan Soto is trying to catch him, <laughs> and he might. That's that's pretty awesome. That's pretty. That was unbelievable. That that was the best moment we've ever had on this podcast. <laughs> I I hope that's not true. That, that that doesn't that doesn't say much about the podcast if that was the best moment you've ever had. Come on, give yourself some credit. Appreciate that. The funniest moment. The funniest. The funniest moment. moment. That's a better way. All to right, all right. I'll take that. Now, listen, I'll take best moment too if you guys want to give it to me. I'm just trying to, trying to be <laughs> humble. <laughs> All right, so uh, Jeff, we need to ask you a serious question. Ever since baseball season started this year, me and Earl's friends have been debating this nonstop in school. If Barry Bonds is a Hall of Famer, give us your take on the, that debate. Sorry, lost you there for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, to me, the Hall of Fame is a place that is a history museum. I don't look at the Hall of Fame as some like virtuous place that represents all of the best things about baseball. No, the Hall of Fame is a place that to me tells the story of the history of baseball. And Barry Bonds is unequivocally part of the history of baseball. He has the most home runs of any player ever. He has arguably the best season, maybe multiple seasons of any player ever. And, and to not have him in the hall of fame, uh, it, it just seems wrong to me. It, it seems like you, you can't properly tell the story of baseball without Barry Bonds being included. And, and I think you can do it in a way that, illustrate some of the things that he did a conversation about performance enhancing drugs and about uh what they what they did to players and how they changed and affected players but the idea that you keep him out uh i'm sorry i just i think that's foolish and uh i stopped voting for the hall of fame because i thought that the the tack that the museum took toward performance enhancing drug using players uh, was hypocritical and wrong. And, and I think that, you know, over time, others have, have jumped on and seen that same thing and, and recognized that a Hall of Fame without Barry Bonds uh, just isn't a, a Hall of Fame that is telling the right story about baseball. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, 20 years, if you try to tell the story of the MLB, which would probably take days and months to tell, you could not include Barry Bonds out of that story. It, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, and, and listen, I, I get, if you want to sit here and say PEDs have no place in the game, we should not reward somebody who used them. I do get that argument. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I don't think that it's an argument that's particularly flawed. I just think it's a moral argument. And I think that uh, once you start jumping into morality, when it comes to looking at ball players, it becomes a, a very slippery slope. And I know that others have done that with Kurt Schilling. And, and Kurt Schilling is somebody with whom I disagree on a lot of things. But I still, when I voted, voted for Kurt Schilling because I thought that his what he had done on the field was worthy of being uh, enshrined in a museum. And I, I think one point that I bring up when you talk about the Barry Bonds debate is how, yeah, he used PEDs. I'm sure maybe a few home runs uh, were added on as a result of that. But you still have to be able to hit the ball. You still have to see pitches. And that takes so much skill that you don't just – they don't get from PEDs. And I think that if you look beyond just the PEDs, I think that he's still obviously an incredible baseball player and certainly deserving of going to Cooperstown. Yeah, I mean, there's that, but there's also the argument. Then, if he could do all those things, then why did he take them? Yeah. Exactly. Why, why did Why did he disrespect this game that has given him so much by 
uh, making himself into, uh, I mean, the, you know, the most controversial person and bringing that uh, on this sport that already was reeling from PDU scandals, uh, you know, a decade plus earlier. I think that's the frustrating part of Barry Bonds. It's the, the fact that he, it, and, and Alex Rodriguez the same, and Manny Ramirez the same, um, you know, and, and David Ortiz and so many others who uh, tested positive, they could have been great without the PEDs. So why did they choose to use them? I, I, I just look back uh, at, at those decisions and wish that they, that they were the case, but they are, and you need to, to look at them uh, through that, you know, look at, look at all of history through that context. Yep, yeah. I certainly agree. So uh, let's move on from the talk of uh, Barry Bonds and uh, other players that could be in the Hall of Fame if it were for PEDs. And let's move into some present-day baseball. So going into the season, the NL East is uh, certainly looked at as one of the if one of the best, if not the best division of baseball, and also the, one of the most competitive divisions in baseball, who do you think gets out of that division and why? I have been since the start of the season, since before the season, uh, on the Atlanta Braves bandwagon. I, I saw the Braves in the NLCS last year. Uh, mm-hmm. They were a win away from dethroning, not even dethroning, but you know, making sure the Dodgers didn't win their first championship in 32 years. And they went out and got better this offseason. I think we've seen early this season, uh, Ronald Cunha has his sights, not just on Juan Soto and Fernando Tatis Jr., but on Mike Trout. Mm-hmm. Like, he, he looks, he, he has the look of uh, the best player in baseball. You know, and whether it's beating out, like, not a routine, but beating out a hard hit ground ball to shortstop or scoring uh, from third on a pop-up to second or hitting more home runs than anyone has in the big leagues this year. Uh, he's that dynamic type of player. And, oh, by the way, he happens to be on the same team as the reigning National League MVP. So it's not like, you know, he's surrounded by chop liver either. Uh, the Braves had their issues, and, and the Mets – uh, certainly with Jacob DeGrom are capable of going out there and, and being great. Um, but I still think that even after that poor start, the Braves are the team to be. And uh, you talked about the Dodgers, who are the reigning uh, World Series champs. Who do you see as the biggest threat to beat them, either in the AL or the NL? Themselves. <laughs> Good answer. I'm, uh, I'm ser- I mean, I'm serious. Like, the, the biggest the biggest threat to the Dodgers is injuries. I don't think it's anyone else. I think they're that much better than every other team out there. If you if you give me the Dodgers of the field, I'll take the Dodgers. And and very rarely do you see a baseball team that's that much better than its contemporaries that you would do that. But that that's that is what I've seen from the Dodgers so far. And if they stay healthy, I don't think anyone can catch them. I definitely uh, agree with that. Um, flipping back to the NL East, one team that sort of has been a mediocre team over the past few seasons after being just flat out awful, the Philadelphia Phillies, off to a decent start this year, have struggled the past few games, now sitting at six and six. Uh, a clear center field problem for them. Uh, the bats really aren't clicking right now. What do you see needs to be done if they want to get into that mix uh, to have a chance at the division with the Braves and the Mets? I mean, they've got the pitching in terms of the the guys at the front of their rotation. I mean, it, you know, there are not a lot of teams that can go Nola, Wheeler, Eflin at the top of their mm-hmm. rotation. Um, the bullpen is still a big question mark for me. And I understand in that first week it looked a lot better, but I still think that there are depth problems there. And, I, you know, the, the offense, it's just it, – it's one of those things that's very frustrating because – you see a team that has Bryce Harper and has Alec Bone and has JT Real Muto, has Reese Hoskins, and has Andrew McCutcheon, you know, guys who can hit and they just don't put up an overwhelming number of runs. Um, that, that to me is the biggest question. What are their bats going to bring? And are their bats going to be enough? to make up for their lack of bullpen. Mm-hmm. So Jeff, we really appreciate you coming on, but before we let you go, we have a, another serious question for you. 
So you're a well-respected, established uh, journalism in the sports world. And so and for two 17-year-olds who are trying to get into the business, what advice would you give your 17-year-old self about getting into sports? I'll tell you what, there's one reason that I'm on this podcast right now. And it's because you have the balls enough to call me up yeah. and say, can you come on our podcast? Because the answer is pretty much always no. I'll be honest, I get asked to go on, like, I'm not trying to sound like a dick here. I get asked to go on a lot of podcasts. And, and, and if I said yes to all of them, I would pretty much spend my life talking on podcasts and, and being a terrible father and, and a terrible husband and a terrible reporter and all those things. I'll just be opining on podcasts. Um, it, it's about having the courage to do things that others might not. And that is taking a risk, whether uh, it's, it's working at a, a college newspaper, whether it's working at a TV station, doing uncomfortable things, challenging things, and, and knowing that you better put in the work because this industry has a finite number of jobs and a lot of very talented and competent people who are filling them. And so as long as you're out there grinding, as long as you're out there asking questions all the time and being curious and trying to understand the thing that you're covering, you're, you're going to be okay. Um, but it's a job that takes an immense amount of work and, and the willingness to, to do things that others uh, might not be. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Jeff. Pleasure is mine, fellas. Thanks for having me. Of course.